By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today it is Tuesday, so that means that we are going, going to go back to the Wizards Cup, the tournament where you brew decks with Homelands, Fallen Empires and The Dark. And we have entered the top eight, so only the eight best decks remain. Remember, we started with 37 players, only eight players remain, and I happen to be one of them. And in this episode, I am taking on Carl uh, for a top eight spot. And Carl is playing with a mono red, basically burn deck. I mean, this is some serious stuff. I've played against this deck before in the group stages. It's going to be a rough one. I'm, of course, still playing the Journey to the Wizard School Mono Blue. So um, it's going to be interesting. Before I dive into the actual deck tech, I would just like to point out that you can also go straight to the games and you can do that by checking the description below. There you will find several timestamps. One of those is marked MTG Games. Click on there, that will take you straight to the games. And what you can also find in the description is a link to the tournament website. So if you would like to know more about the Wizards Cup, about the specific rule sets, the restricted cards, um, see all the deck photos, for example, just visit the tournament website. It is quite interesting. And there you can check all the info about this event. Okay, enough about that. This was the introduction. And now we're going to dive into the decks. And we're actually going to start with the deck of my opponent today. Let's take a look at Carl's Mono Red Burn. Okay, so here we see the deck of my opponent, Carl. Well, actually not the deck, we see part of his deck, because unfortunately I do not have a deck photo, but I do have a very good idea what his deck is about. So first off, it's mono red. And secondly, it is mono red, right? So we, we kind of know what mono red wants to do. So I've called this deck, The Roof is on Fire, right? Named after, of course, uh, the famous song by the Bloodhound Gang, because I think basically, what Carl wants to do here is just burn me out as fast as possible, right? And I'm probably just gonna sit there and think, okay, the roof the roof is on fire, I should do something now, but I kinda can't, because I'm just gonna take in more direct damage. Uh, so before we actually go and have a look at the direct damage package, which you can already kind of see on the right side of this, uh, of this uh, slide, uh, let's kind of start on the left, let's look at his creature base. So he's playing with a couple of one drops in the form of Goblin Digging Team, then he's got Goblin Rock Sled, one red and one for a three one trampler. Um, and then he's also playing with fire drake that has some evasion. It's a flyer, flyer. There are not too many flyers in this format. So flying is actually a pretty good ability, uh, evasive ability in uh, in homelands, fallen empires and uh, the dark constructed. So it's uh, for two red and one, it's a one two flyer that you can pump to become a two two. So it's, it's actually pretty bad, but in this format, it can kind of work. He's also playing with brothers of fire, which is a card that I kind of fear two red and one. For two red and one, Brothers of Fire uh, does one damage to any target and one damage to you. And the cool thing about this card is you don't have to tap it, so you can play it, and if you've got enough mana, you can immediately use uh, use its ability. And this card is going to be really good against my Ruveka Wizard Savant, because it's just an O1. It's also going to be really good against my Apprentice Wizards, because they're also just O1s. Um, so I'm kind of fearing... Uh, this card a little bit. And then we also have uh, Bull Lightning, three red, of course, six one trample that can attack the turn it comes into play. So that's, I guess Bull Lightning is one of the more famous cards in this format because you also see it in, in other old school formats. So a very strong card. Um, but of course, if I have, for example, Wizard Savant on the battlefield, I can just deal two damage to the Bull Lightning. If I have Chain Stasis, I can tap the Bull Lightning down. So Bull Lightning is kind of risky. And also I'm playing with the Maze of If, so that can also work against Bull Lightning. Talking about Maze of If, one of the cool things that Carl has done with this deck is he's playing it with, uh, with Blood Moon. And uh, the cool thing about Blood Moon, of course, is it turns all the non-basics uh, into uh, into mountains, and you might think, okay, is it actually useful because he's playing my deck and I'm playing mono blue? Well, it actually is because I'm playing with Fallen Empire lands, I'm playing with, um, you know, non-basic lands from the dark. So there are actually, I think, five or six non-basic lands in my deck. So it's not completely useless. And the interesting thing is it takes care of Maze of If, which is good news, of course, for the ball lightning. But also, let's go back to Goblin Rock Sled. I think it's such a flavorful card. And as you can see, like a lot of old school cards, there's a lot of text on there. So it's 3-1 Trample, right? Now let's read the, re the rest of the card. So Rock Sled may not attack unless opponents control at least one mountain. Rock Sled does not untap as normal during your untap phase if it attacked during your last turn. I think this card 
is so flavorful. You know, art, ability, and stats, they all come together in this card. Maybe it should have had first strike as well because it's sliding off of the mountain in top speed, right? It's going so fast, do you have time to respond? But, you know, maybe that's something for another discussion. But what I like, you see two goblins racing down a slope in a sled, right? So, of course, they need your opponent uh, to have a mountain because they're going up your mountain and they're going to slide towards your life total. You know, they're going to go in full attack. And why do they stay tapped the next turn? Because they need a whole turn to get back up the mountain with the sled. So, I really like, like, the flavor. I think it's something that you... that that comes natural in a lot of old school cards. And now when you look at modern magic, it kind of seems forced. You know, they want to, the cards that kind of have a joke in modern magic, they, they seem more like a gimmick. Whereas in old school, it seems more genuine. Maybe that doesn't make any sense, but that's at least how it feels to me. Okay, so now we've kind of looked at the creatures. We've discussed it a little bit. Now let's look at the most important part of the deck and the deck I fear most, the burn part. Uh, we see Inferno for two red and five deals six damage to everything, every player, every creature. Uh, at least I can still regenerate. So maybe if I'm lucky, I can regenerate some ghost ships and kind of have some survivors survive the Inferno. But I fear, what I fear the most is the six damage, direct damage that he's gonna deal. Because I think early game, he's gonna put some pressure on me, he's gonna deal some damage, and then he's gonna put an Inferno on top of that. And then after that is icing on the cake, I'm kind of fearing the Eternal Flame. So Eternal Flame, two red and two, sorcery from the dark, an eternal flame does an amount of damage to your opponent equal to the number of mountains you control, but it also does half that damage amount uh, to you rounding up. So eternal flame is just a great finisher card, and I think it's kind of my job to try to put some early pressure on the life total of Carl to make it difficult for him to actually use his eternal flame. You know, because if his life is too low and he'll take half of the damage as well to himself, it could kind of end up in a tie which is fine because then we just play another game. So, you know, putting some early pressure on is going to be hard with my deck, but I'm actually going to try. Uh, talking about that, let's take a look at my deck journey uh, to the wizard school and have a look what I can do against this, uh, this red violence. So let's take a look at my deck. And here we see my deck journey to the wizard school. And if you've been following this series series here on Timmy Talks, you're probably pretty familiar with this deck, right? So this is really the mono blue kind of style that you expect. A lot of disruption, uh, you know, like memory lapse, like jinx, like chain stasis. Um, and then uh, just a lot of what blue wants to do once you, once you go into mid game, late game, just starting to do some shenanigans. So for me, for example, Hummer it's spawning bad is a really important card in this deck. It's an enchantment, two blue and one to, uh, two blue to cast and then two blue and one to use to activate. And then you can sacrifice target creature and you gain one, one tokens, blue tokens, equal to the casting cost of that creature, right? So if I, for example, can uh, sacrifice the deep spawn, I'm just gonna add eight 1-1 one, one blue combated tokens to my board, which is pretty good, but it's even better when you've got a sunken city out and you've got eight 2-2 two, two creatures that can attack. So that's kind of like the shenanigans that I wanna do. Now the problem with these strategies is I need time. And I think against Carl, who's just this quick mono red burn player, I'm not sure if I'm going to get the time. So what I'll need to do is really keep the burn package in the back of my mind and realize I have to protect my life total early on. So I'm hoping to draw into some AO piles early, a maze of if early, um, hopefully some memory lapses so I can just disrupt whatever he's doing, maybe use a giant oyster to, to, oyster to trap one of his creatures and then maybe I can kind of stall the game um, into that mid game and try to deploy a lot of threats and kind of kill him before he kills me with his burn. I think that's my best option pre-board. Uh, pre and then after sideboard, I am actually seeing more chances for me. I think that I've got a pretty big chance of losing the first game, but then winning the second game after sideboarding. And why is that? Because I've got some pro red creatures in the sideboard. I get Sea Sprite, a 1-1 one, one flyer from Homelands with protection from red. I've got Narwhal, also from Homelands, a 2-2 two, two first strike of protection from red. So I think those are really good cards that I can um, put in from the sideboard. I can also put in my extra AO pile um, to have some more ways to kind of deal with early pressure. I think it's important that at the start of the game, my life total stays high enough so that later in the game, I can just attack him with a swarm of Kamarae tokens. Now, another strategy after sideboard will be a much more creature-heavy strategy. So I actually won't rely as heavy 
on, for example, that Comerit strategy, token strategy, I can also rely just on my flyers. I'll have four ghost ships, I'll have four sea sprites, I'll have three narwhals, you know, so I'll have more things, more weapons uh, to put pressure on Carl. And I think that's actually going to be good. So for game one, I think, you know, Carl is definitely the favorite. But after that, after sideboarding, I'm seeing options and it would just be fantastic to reach the semis. But I mean, this is going to be a tough battle. Um, so this is my deck. And actually, uh, now talking about the AO piles, I didn't mention that in Carl's deck, but Carl is also playing with a playset of AO piles. And that can actually be a problem for me because it's really nice to have a pro red creature on the board like Narwhal, but AO pile is colorless damage. So he can still kill my Narwhal with an AO pile, right? So pro red doesn't mean it cannot be killed. You know, there are serrated arrows in this format as well and an AO pile. So it's not safe, but at least it's better than having creatures that don't have that pro red protection because it does protect them from you know direct damage it protects them from brothers of fire so it's it is good but it's not going to save them so i kind of need luck to be on my side i also think in this matchup that ghost ship is huge if i look at the creatures of carl they're kind of small and ghost ship that four toughness makes it huge it can kill actually most of the creatures of carl uh, it can also be a great blocker for a ball lightning especially if i have just three blue open and it can still regenerate block the ball lightning and only take two damage so I think that's going to be an important piece of the puzzle as well. And like always in Magic, um, you need a little bit of luck. And if I have that luck, I think I can win. But the same counts for Carl. Let's go to the games. Game number one. Here we go. So quarterfinals of the Wizards Cup. Both of us are taking a mulligan, it seems. Carl is on the play, starting with the basic mountain. There I go with the Vodalian Temple. The land from Fallen Empires. There's an AO pile from Carl here. Another Fodalian on the battlefield, Fodalian Temple. And there is a Brothers of Fire. So the 2 2, we talked about him briefly in the deck deck. So it can deal one point of damage to any target for two red and one. And then you also take one damage yourself. And this is just very annoying. And I'm playing a Merchant Scroll here. I'm looking up a Jinx. That's pretty interesting. So Jinx allows you to change a basic land in any other land type until end of turn and it, it is a cantrip so you can draw another card uh, during the next upkeep so maybe i'm just playing it for that and there's also the fire drake so we can see that early pressure from carl here i'm already on 18 next turn he can start dealing some more da damage playing the jinx here to change one of his mountains into islands and uh, the next upkeep, so in my turn, I can draw an extra card. So he's tapping three. Is it going to be another Fire Drake or another Brothers of Fire? We'll just have to wait and see. And, and hopefully I have a memory lapse to kind of slow him down a little bit. He's untapping again. Tapping two instead. And there's a Goblin Rock Sled. Now remember, he cannot attack with the Goblin Rock Sled yet. He first needs to make a mountain on my side. Attacking with both here. Four damage. Going to go to uh, 14. And I'm taking that extra card from the Jinx. That's why I'm drawing two cards. Hopefully playing a ghost ship. Okay, there's a ghost ship. But it's not great because Carl has an AO pile. So he can attack. And then if I block, for example, uh, a 2-2, two -two, he can use the AO pile to kill it because they don't have enough mana. Oh! Fisher, okay, it's okay. Wow, that just buries the creature, by the way. Fisher, you can't even regenerate, even if I had three blue open. A full swing there, four more damage. I'm on, or three more damage actually, couldn't pump anymore. I'm on 11, finding another ghost ship. So these ghost ships are good, but there's just too much pressure. And the problem, of course, as well, is that three regenerate. Oh, there we see a bull lightning, and this is perfect work from Carl here, kind of forced to tap it okay then i can sack one of my sack lands to regenerate it at least and i guess i'm gonna block the bull lightning here taking four more damage and of course a trample damage six in total going from 11 to five this is going to be a really short game number one what can i do another ghost ship i have to say i'm finding tons of ghost ships and that should be a good thing but carl is simply putting too much pressure on also playing a sunken city here kind of taking a risk not having any lands to regenerate them anymore, but choosing to pump my... Oh, this is great. Blood Moon means that he can actually attack with the Goblin Rock Sled. That is so cool to see. 
And remember, my ghost ships are now 3-5 because of the Sunken City bonus. Let's see how I'm going to block here. It's always kind of hard to follow, I guess. Yeah, he's going to pump the Fire Drake. I blocked the other two, so I'm going to go to 3. He can now use the AO Pile if he wants to. I guess the Goblin Rockslet is going to die and the Brothers of Fire are going to die. So he's going to, yeah, this is what he's going to do. going to kill my ghost ship with the AO Pile, the one that I used to block the Rockslet. And now I only have one blocker, but he only has a Fire Drake. So that's good. The problem, of course, is that direct damage that Carl has in his deck. But I have to play towards my outs, right? So keeping some mana open. Oh, changing my mind, actually. <laughs> That is, in why am I changing my mind? I mean, I had enough. I could just sack the Vodalian Temple to regenerate uh, the ghost ship. Oh, yeah, it doesn't matter. Eternal Flame, it doesn't matter. It's over. And yeah, you kind of know, this is what I was talking about. You kind of know, okay, this Eternal Flame is coming. I took too much damage already in the early stages. Uh, okay, so I lost this one. Good job, Carl. Your deck worked like clockwork in this first game. Uh, we're going to go into our sideboards, and hopefully my sideboard can kind of help me out here, and uh, and I can make it into a real match in game number two. Game number two, and at least now I'm on the play, right? So that, that's going to help me. Hopefully, I just don't need to take a mulligan and things will be fine. I must say I'm kind of impressed by Carl's deck because, I mean, I drew into a lot of ghost ships. Ghost ships are really good in this format, but, I mean, Carl took care of them one at a time. Okay, tapping two, you're playing a conch horn. So that's an artifact from Fallen Empires. You can pay one in sack to draw two cards. There's that rock slide again. He cannot attack with it yet. So I'm kind of safe here. Using my conch horn, drawing two, then putting one back. Hopefully I then have a merchant scroll and I can kind of shuffle away that card. No, not a merchant scroll. I do have an AO pile. So that's kind of okay. There is another rock sled, so let's hope that Carl doesn't find a Blood Moon, because at Fodalian Temple he can turn it into a mountain. Then again, of course, I can sack the Fodalian Temple in response. I wonder if I'm clever enough to remember that, so we'll just have to find out. Because I didn't do that um, in game one, by the way. And there is an AO pile from my opponent as well, and there is a ghost ship. The beautiful altered one done by Lady Death Touch. Very talented altar lady. Oh, and look at that. Again, a quick answer with the Dwarven Catapult. And I have no three blue open to regenerate it. Oh, man. Do I have... A, no, not another ghost ship. I do have a giant oyster. So a giant oyster is an O3 creature. And you can kind of tap it. And then target creature doesn't untap during the next untap step. And it then slowly gets minus one, minus one counters on it during the upkeep. Okay, I must say I'm actually drawing kind of okay, you know, I can't complain about that. I mean, finding another ghost ship here. I've got some creatures, I've got the mana to regenerate, only two cards in hand though, and a lot of mountains on the side of Carl. And, oh, retribution! Oh, that means I gotta kill one of my creatures and put a minus one, minus one counter on the other one. Oh, this is such a good card. Another removal. Uh, there goes the giant oyster, of course, choosing to keep my ghost ship around. I mean, it just seems that Carl has an answer every time I play something. And again, Retribution is another really nice way to kind of work around, um, uh, to kind of work around regeneration of ghost ship. So he's got Fishers, he's got Retributions. This is just pretty brutal. Playing another Island, attacking here. Only have a few cards in hand though. Another Giant Oyster, okay. Giant Oyster is nice in defending, but right now I would love to kind of see maybe the Narwhal from the sideboard, although he would probably blow it up immediately with the AO Piles. That's not going to be very useful. But then again, it does take care of an AO Pile. And that's the way I look at it. Let's see what Carl can do. Uh-oh, he's stepping a lot. Dwarven Catapult. So I'm regenerating my ghost ship, and uh, but he is killing my giant oyster. So the way that Dwarven Catapult works is automatically um, divides the damage that you do to the creatures of your opponent. So he did a Dwarven Catapult for six. I had, I had two creatures on board, means each creature takes three damage. Oh, Ring of Renewal. This can be a game changer. Ring of Renewal, your hands empty. Ring of Renewal, five and tap to draw two cards. And you first have to discard a card, but if you don't have a card in hand... Oh, Bull Lightning! Another Bull Lightning! Oh! 
Playing AO pile on one of them. Okay, at least I had the AO pile still. Taking six from the other one. Oh, man, that AO pile is definitely a lifesaver here. I am dropping to 14. Also, look at the land count of my opponent, right? If he can draw into an Eternal Flame, he can deal seven damage with one Eternal Flame. Playing an Amnesia. Okay, this can be big. Look at that. Losing the Inferno. So this was a great Amnesia for me. And I wonder, should I still attack with the ghost ship? And I'm not doing it. Just too afraid to find more, um, more bow lightnings. But I am attacking right now. I wonder why do I have an answer then maybe to a bow lightning. And then Ensep probably going to use Ring of Renewal. What do I have in hand? Chain Stasis. Okay, Chain Stasis is really nice. For one blue, I can untap something or tap something. Um, and the cool thing is it works really, really good against Bow Lightning, right? Bow Lightning comes into play. I can just play the Chain Stasis and tap it down. Really nice. And of course, using my Ring of Renewal or drawing two cards and drawing a card for turn, that means that I kind of had an Ancestral Recall moment. There is a Flood. Again, a very good card against Bow Lightning. There is a Maze. There is a Narwhal. 2-2 two, two, First Strike. Protection from Red attacking right now. And I'm deciding to untap it. I really wonder if he's going to use the AO pile against the Narwhal. Attacking here with my forces. Carl is on 16, by the way. It's going super slow because of the earlier minus one, minus one counter from that retribution. But at least I'm doing some damage. I wonder, okay, Carl's using AO pile, taking care of my Narwhal. Dealing one point of damage, going down to 15, untapping the ghost ship. Playing another Narwhal. Okay, those Narwhals can be kind of decisive here because they are pro-red. So hopefully it can kind of stick to the board. Another Ale Pile. I guess that's my answer. It cannot stick to the board. Using Ring of Renewal here to draw two more cards. I think with this card advantage, I should be able to kind of win the game. But I have to put pressure on. Okay, there is Sunken City in response. I'm going to use Ale Pile. That's good magic, Carl. Taking care of my Narwhal. Playing another AO pile, attacking. Remember, the ghost ship is now a 2-4 again because of the Sunken City. And passing turn here. Interestingly enough, choosing not to untap the maze. Using Ring of Renewal, discarding my Amnesia, of course. It's not too useful with Carl, who's not completely empty-handed, but pretty much empty-handed. And attacking again. And, okay, finding the Serrated Arrows, another card that does wonders against the Bull Lightning. But my fear right now really goes to Eternal Flame kind of cards. If you can draw into two Eternal Flames in a row, I'm toast. Yeah, that's the first Eternal Flame, so look at that. But he's also going to damage himself, remember that. So two, four, six, ten damage. That means he's going to take five, he's on six, but I'm on four. Look at my life total. If he can find Inferno or another Eternal Flame, I'm toast. Okay, going to draw. I think, actually, I also have that AO pile still to deal some damage. Hopefully, I can find a way to finish it this turn already. I think I need an extra turn, though. Another Sunken City dealing three, going to three. It's not enough. It's not enough. I can get him to one. It's not enough. If he gets an Eternal Flame, I'm done. I'm done. I'm out of the tournament. Is he going to find Inferno or Eternal Flame? Inferno or Eternal Flame? I don't think so because he's going through his deck. So, okay. <laughs> okay, he says this is your your game. Oh, man. Oh, this was this was a close one. But it's 1-1. One, one, and that means we're going to get a third game. Another battle to try to find out who's going to make it into the semifinals of perhaps one of the greatest Homelands tournaments ever. The Wizards Cup. Game number three. The this decider here. Who is going to continue to the semifinals? Will it be Carl... Or will it be me? Well, Carl's back on the play, doing what he wants to do, putting some early pressure on. We see the Goblin Digging Team. Haven't seen that one first. If you're not familiar with the card, by the way, read the flavor text. I think it's really funny. And I'm starting with my Fodalian Temple again, which is really a good opener for me because I don't ever turn one play anyway. So the land coming into play tapped really doesn't set me back at all as long as it's a first turn play. So for me, it's a perfect opener. And no follow-up by my opponent, Carl, which is actually good news. There is a Sea Sprite, 1-1 Flyer, Homelands, Protection from Red. So that can at least deal some damage here to Carl. And of course also uh, prevent Carl from attacking here 
with the digging team. There is a Brothers of Fire. So the brothers cannot kill my Sea Sprite, but it is, of course, a problem because he can't attack. So I'm probably going to keep my uh, Sea Sprite on guarding, uh, ju blocking duty. And they are playing a Conch Horn and passing turn. So Conch Horn, an artifact from Fallen Empire, is right. I can sack it to draw two cards, and then I got to put a card back from my hand on top of my library. Another three. Okay, there's a Bow Lightning. I wonder what he's going to do here. So if I attack, of course, I can block with the Bow Lightning, but the trample damage still goes over. So, I mean, I'm still going to get damage anyway. And I was attacking with everything. So I can block the Digging Team, kill the Digging Team and take a damage. Or I can block the Brothers of Fire. And I'm not quite sure why I'm doing what I'm doing. Okay, I think I'm blocking the Brothers of Fire here. Okay, blocking the Goblin Digging Team instead. Okay, it's, see, <laughs> that's always kind of difficult to see how these blocks go. But anyway, I'm ending up at 11. So this is a great turn uh, for Carl here because he just wants to, you know, to put my life total down as low as possible and finish it finish it off with direct damage like, like he did in game one and like he almost did in game number two, by the way, because that was really, really close. And now we're in game three here. Hopefully I can find something else, another temple need something more finding an ao pile okay i can use that to kill the brothers of fire and i think that's good actually not doing it that is interesting do i want to keep my ao pile open for for a possible bull lightning of course the problem with brothers of fire is carl's on 20 so it'll just start pinging me slowly killing me slowly getting me deeper into trouble and here's the AO pile from Carl so he can use it to take care of my sea sprite. I'm not sure if he wants to. Maybe he wants to keep it. Wait for a bigger threat. Also really nice. An AO pile in combination with the Brothers of Fire. And he's going to use Brothers of Fire. Going to put me on 10. Going to put himself on 19. And I wonder if I'm not going to use AO pile and step. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm going to do. I think in hindsight, I think I should have used my AO pile the turn before that. Looks like Carl's... Okay, yeah, Carl was frozen for a moment. Anyway, I should have used the AO pile before and then attack with the Sprite. Okay, sacking. Oh, Amnesia. Okay, this is actually good news. If I can kind of get his... Take the cards out of his hand and kind of get some card advantage. Yeah, so I'm sacking the Voldalian Temple to get two blue. It's six to cast, so I've got enough. Now he's got to show me his hand and discard every... Oh, this is great. Fire Drake gone and one of those Eternal Flames gone. This is really great for me attacking here with the Sea Sprite. This Amnesia was really important. This is really what's kind of perhaps it's going to help me. The problem here is I'm already on 10 and it's kind of worrying, right? So I still got, I mean, I've got more cards in hand. But my life total was so low. Maybe I should have played with Fountain of Youth in the sideboard against decks like this to at least have a way to gain life. Let's see, playing another blue. Because you have to remember, it's difficult in Fallen Empires to Dark and Homelands to actually have ways to gain life. Fountain of Youth is actually one of the best ways to do it. And playing a Narwhal 2-2 First Strike Pro Red, attacking again with the Sea Sprite, he's on 17. Of course, I was hoping that Carl would use the AO Pile against the Sea Sprite. There's an Eternal Flame taking six damage. Gonna go down to four. And I can tell you, I'm not feeling comfortable at all. This is looking really bad. Of course, Carl is taking some damage here. Three damage himself. Gonna go down to 14. I'm gonna swing in for three here. And of course, he doesn't want to use the AO pile on a creature. He wants to use it on my life total. And I think he's right to do so. He just wants to play according... Um, he wants to play towards his outs. That, that's what I'm trying to say here. And is it another Eternal Flame? Oh, no. Is it another? If it's an Eternal Flame, he's won. If it's a Bull Lightning, he's won. I mean, he's got so many outs. I think he's passing turn, by the way, in the meanwhile. So he didn't find it. So I'm able to deal some damage. He's on eight, playing another Sea Sprite. Oh, maybe I have memory lapse in hand. That would be just fantastic. Okay, crossing my fingers here. Oh, no, no. Do you have memory lapse? Oh, two islands. I have to say, I haven't really seen a single memory lapse, I think, in this whole 
match but Carl congratulations man I mean you're the winner and I think in all fairness your deck is better your deck is better you also beat me in the group stages I believe and uh, yeah your 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 deck is just more efficient like red burn is uh, is huge and um, I think you've earned your spot in the semifinals and actually in those semifinals you're gonna play against another red player the red dwarven deck that we've saw saw earlier uh, battling it out for a top 16 match because they also won uh, Rob also won his top eight so um, if you want to see the rest of the Wizards Cup you can do that right here on Timmy talks um, you can check out the playlist um, uh, of the Wizards Cup where you can see all the other matches that have, have been covered so far and you can of course tune in again next week Tuesday when, when I have another episode of this Wizards Cup and then it's going to be the semi-finals already and of course after that the finals now if you want to know more about the tournament like I said in the intro of this vid check the description below there you will find uh, a link to the tournament website um, and also you can uh, help the channel out you can help me out um, how can you do that it is quite simple leave a like leave a comment share the videos on your socials if you like them of course i mean don't don't share anything if you don't like it don't don't do it just because i asked you to although yeah it would be kind of nice uh and of course subscribe if you're not a subscriber yet i would really really appreciate it another thing that you can do is you can join our patreon and then you can become a patron of the channel and you can actually join tournaments like this you can also join our little community on discord which is slowly growing and you can get your name in the end scroll. And isn't that everybody's dream to be in the Timmy Talks end scroll? Of course it is. Talking about that, let's go and take a look at that lovely end scroll. And let's take a look at all the fantastic channel members and patrons of Timmy Talks. Ik het als fikker te samba kazing.